You can sign up for my newsletter at historyasithappens.com. Just enter your email address, and every Friday morning you'll get my ideas about the history behind the headlines. Everything happening today comes from something, somewhere. My newsletter every Friday, new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. A podcast for people who want to think about current events historically. History as it happens, September 27, 2022. Annexation. In an escalation of the war in Ukraine, Moscow today launched what the U.S. called illegal vote. Election officials comb the streets, urging residents to come outside and vote. What Putin has done is not exactly a sign of strength or confidence. Frankly, it's a sign that they are struggling badly on the Russian side. Rather than change course, however, President Putin has doubled down, not to work toward a diplomatic solution, but to render such a solution impossible by seeking to annex more Ukrainian territory through sham referenda. Russia is trying to accomplish in a sham process what it can't do on the battlefield. That is, conquer eastern Ukraine. So now Vladimir Putin may be on the verge of annexing four regions, making them part of Russia in no one's eyes but his own, and those of his sycophants in the Kremlin. Annexation could close the door for good on peace talks, leading to years of hot war and frozen conflict. That's next, as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Russia's decision to send troops into Crimea has rightly drawn global condemnation. Large groups of pro-Russia troops surrounding Ukrainian bases ordering... We've seen an illegal referendum in Crimea, an illegitimate move by the Russians to annex Crimea. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has launched a major military operation against Ukraine. We are going to support Speaking Ukraine as long as it takes. The result of the votes is a foregone conclusion. But you've got to remember that the, the separatist republics of the Donbass uh, voted for independence, declared independence in 2014. But it wasn't until eight years later that Russia actually formally recognized that independence. Way back in March, in an episode titled Why Kyiv May Fall, the military historian Max Hastings shared why he and many other informed observers believed Russia would ultimately prevail in the war. I must admit, I I hate to be a party pooper because we're all so full of admiration for the courage displayed by the Ukrainian people. And they have put out, they are putting up a, a terrific performance. And they're giving the Russian army the sort of beating they richly deserve. But the Russians are still enormously strong. And I was talking earlier this week to some of my military friends here. First of all, they still think that the Russians in the end can prevail, can just batter their way to something that Putin can call victory. And secondly, of course, we're all haunted by fears that the Russians may use some terrible weapons. Again, rightly or wrongly, my military friends think more likely chemical or biological weapons than nuclear. In this situation, we can't rule anything out. Well, here we are seven months later, and the war has defied our expectations. Not when it comes to the incalculable damage done to lives and homes and infrastructure, and not in terms of the horrors that accompany every war. In this case, massacres and torture committed by the Russian invaders. We expected those things, but most of us did not expect Ukraine could win militarily and so humiliate the Russian army that Vladimir Putin has now reluctantly ordered a partial mobilization in a desperate attempt to turn the tide, a move greeted by protests in major cities. Well, if the reality on the ground is Ukrainian victory, not total victory, but substantial insofar the defenders routed Russian soldiers in the Kharkiv region and retook 2,000 square miles of territory in the east and south, if that is the reality, the Kremlin is, as I speak into this microphone in late September, trying to perpetrate a fantasy in the separatist Luhansk and Donetsk regions in Ukraine's eastern industrial heartland, as well as the Kurzon and Zaporizhia regions in the south. Sham referenda are underway that are rigged to show those regions want to join Russia, leading to formal annexation by Moscow. Similar to what happened in Crimea in 2014, an illegal act the U.S. was unable to stop. In recent months, as the citizens of Ukraine have made their voices heard, we have been guided by a fundamental principle. The future of Ukraine must be decided by the people of Ukraine. 
So if Moscow goes through with the annexation, any chance for peace negotiations, at least in the short and medium term, could evaporate. Instead of negotiations, eastern Ukraine will be plunged into endless conflict, swinging between hot war and temporary ceasefires. I remain as concerned today as I was seven months ago that neither side will be able to impose a true military victory, and the fighting will continue to drag on. And I believe Anatole Levin of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft agrees with me. He usually joins us via Zoom from the United Kingdom, where he suffered through a heat wave without air conditioning this summer. But now Mr. Levin is with us in Washington. Anatole Levin, welcome back to the United States and welcome to the studio in person. Great to be here. As you know, people listen to these podcasts weeks or months after they've been published. But as you and I sit here so comfortably in this air-conditioned studio, the sham referenda are underway in eastern Ukraine. How does this work? Are there polling places? I mean, how does this function on the ground? Because the population of that region does not want to be annexed by Russia. Uh, well, most of them. Most, um, yes. in, in eastern Ukraine, you know, which has been separate since 2014, perhaps there is a a majority vote to join Russia. But it's highly unlikely that the new areas conquered by the Russian army would genuinely vote to join okay. Russia. Well, thank you for clarifying that, but ev- go ahead. Everything that's happened. And, I mean, yeah, as you say, I mean, the vote looks like a total sham. I mean, they're going round from door to door ordering people to vote, but very few polling stations. And in any case, we've got to assume that the Russian authorities will simply stuff the ballot or or not even stuff the ballot, just make up the result. The polls come to you, not the other way around. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So you've been writing for the Quincy Institute at the Responsible Statecraft website about how if this referenda, if these referenda go through, and if Russia, which is an important point to make, and if Russia then decides to recognize the results, that would prevent an end to the war. Explain. Yeah. Well, that's what we're really waiting for. The result of the votes is a foregone conclusion. But you've got to remember that the the separatist republics of the Donbass uh, voted for independence or declared independence in 2014. But it wasn't until eight years later that Russia actually formally recognized that independence. And in the meantime, what Russia did was to basically use that as a bargaining counter or leverage in negotiations, German and French brokered negotiations with Ukraine on these areas returning to Ukraine in return for a guarantee of full autonomy, which Ukraine was not willing to give. The point is that it could be that the Kremlin, having organized these votes, will take note of them, will use them as a bargaining chip, but will not move actually to annex, as they did with Crimea. The difference between Donbass and Crimea was in Crimea in 2014 was annexed by Russia. And since then, Russia has simply regarded this as its sovereign territory. If they don't annex, it is a sign that Russia is still willing or even actually anxious perhaps by now to negotiate some kind of peace settlement. If they do annex, then that's over because no Ukrainian government, no Western government can possibly accept the annexation of these areas to Russia. So then, you know, I think there'll still be a chance perhaps of a ceasefire at some stage if both sides wear themselves out, but there will be no chance of an actual end to the war. So I fumbled my first question a bit about who may support this in the eastern part of Ukraine. I think it's important that I get the geography right. So there's the Donetsk and Luhansk republics that were declared in 2014. But there are other parts of the Donbass region where there are now Russian troops occupying that could potentially be part of this annexation. I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Well, as I can't remember that Alex Baldwin said to Meryl Streep or vice versa, it's complicated. That's right. Well, the, I mean, the battle lines, you know, they change every day, right? Mm-hmm. The front line. Go ahead. Yeah, there's Crimea, which Russia, according to Russia, nobody else accepted, annexed in 2014. Now, that no Russian government can possibly agree to return to Ukraine, I mean, barring a total collapse of the Russian state, partly because it, you know, it holds the great Russian naval base of Sevastopol. And it must be said in Crimea, by the great majority of accounts, a majority of the population 
does actually want to stay with Russia. So Crimea is the first one. Then there are the, the separatist republics of the Donbass, which, however, from 2014 to the invasion this year, did not actually cover occupy the whole territory of the, the Donbass. And in fact, they still don't because Russia, the Russian troops were fought to a standstill. And then there are the additional areas in southern Ukraine that Russia has occupied militarily since February. There is, is where these, these referenda are being. So in all, we're talking about 15 percent of Ukraine's territory potentially annexed by Russia. Yes. Once this is all said and done. But it should be noted on that score, that does still mean 85% of Ukraine's territory will remain independent. Now, I think we need to recognise that both historically, if you go back over the past 400 years, but also in terms of Russia's ambitions, you know, when it launched this invasion, that is a colossal defeat for Russia, a colossal defeat, both because Russia has ruled Ukraine, or most of Ukraine, for the past 400 years, but also because when Putin launched this invasion, his intention was to capture Kiev and to turn Ukraine into a client state. Not, not to destroy Ukraine or commit genocide, that's nonsense, but certainly to, to turn Ukraine into a version of Belarus, you know, neighboring Belarus, which is basically a Russian, you know, a Russian satellite. Now, the complete defeat of that program is a huge defeat for Russia and a huge victory, actually, for, for Ukraine and the West. It's worth pointing this out because, you know, another way of reading these referenda is that Putin has given up on the rest of Ukraine. Now, what that means is, I mean, obviously, this is still a critically important battle for Ukraine. But despite what Secretary Blinken said, the war in Ukraine is no longer an existential war for Ukraine. Ukraine has shown that the vast majority of Ukrainians and the vast majority of Ukrainian territory does not want to be part of Russia and will never be part of Russia. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is Russia won't be able to reverse their setbacks in it, all likelihood. Well, it doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, no. first the Russians were stalled for months. Well, first they were pushed back from around Kiev and defeated. Then they were stalled in their attempts to capture more territory in the east. And most recently, of course, they've actually suffered a major defeat and been pushed out of a large section of territory. And of course, it's because of all this that Putin has now declared partial mobilization. So it really doesn't look as if Russia has it in it to defeat so, Ukraine. So are these annexations a way of Russia saying, look, we want something here? So Putin and his ruling circle can show something for their efforts? Yeah, uh, you know, why bother doing this? I don't get it. Well, as I say, we, we will know it within a week or so what the Kremlin's at least short-term intention They haven't is. annexed them yet. Exactly. But, yes, the fundamental thing for Putin now, but I, I think also not just Putin, probably any successor government as well, will be to try to show that Russia has gained something from what obviously has actually been a, a disaster for Russia. In your writings, you compared this situation to the Kashmir region between Pakistan and India, that we could see something like that develop over the next who knows how many decades. Why don't you explain that? Mm -hmm. Well, I covered Kashmir from both sides of the lines as a journalist in Pakistan and India. And what you had there was, when the British Empire left, a war over the disputed territory of, of Kashmir, which began in, immediately after independence in 1947. And then there was a hot war going on for a year or so. Then there was a ceasefire because both sides ran out of steam. Um, the ceasefire was interrupted by clashes and bombardments and terrorist attacks. Then there was another major war in 65, another major war in 71, and almost a a major war again in 1999. Between those big wars, what you had was an unstable, armed and periodically violent ceasefire. If Russia you know, moves to annex these territories, then that is what we're heading for, because even if you know, Ukraine recaptures all or most of the territory that Russia has occupied since February, the Ukrainian government says that it still won't accept the loss of Crimea in the eastern Donbass. Well, at that point, uh, or of course, actually, I mean, we had a, a ceasefire like that in the eastern Donbass from 2014 to, yeah. to this year. Kashmir held religious significance, correct, for India and Pakistan. That's not the case in the Donbass, but 
Uh, well, you know, it's funny. I, I was just about to say something, then I realized prior to all of this mess, there were some in Ukraine, some informed observers, who believe the Donbass should be allowed to go its own way. Well, that, you see, is the tragic or tragicomic thing. Until emotions became really inflamed as a result of the revolution of 2014 and then, of course, the Russian annexation and the war in the Donbass, there were, even oddly enough, extreme Ukrainian nationalists, ethnic nationalists, who would say in private to me, but sometimes in public as well, for God's sake, we should let these areas go. They don't want to be part of Ukraine. They're overwhelmingly Russian or Russian speaking. And we'd be much stronger without them. Because without them, you know, our Russian population goes down, Russia's ability to pressure and blackmail us goes down. We have a much more homogeneous, coherent Ukraine, which then you know, has a much better chance of moving rapidly towards membership of the West. Now, of course, since the well, as soon as the first began, drop of blood is spilled, it right. becomes the sacred soil of, of Ukraine and so forth. But the truth is, I mean, Crimea was never really part of, of Ukraine, and the Donbass is a genuinely disputed territory. Now, Crimea was part of Russia until Khrushchev decided to give it back to Ukraine as a gift, right? Something like that? Or? Well, not really give it back, just well, give it. Just give it. Yeah. But, but of course, the assumption was that it didn't mean anything because yeah. the Soviet Union was going to last forever. Yeah. If they realized the Soviet Union was going to collapse, they would never have done it. <laughs> <laughs> so you believe each side might actually be ready for negotiations now. You know, I mean, one reason why wars go on and on and on and on is because when the side that seems to be winning is doing really well, like Ukraine right now, well, we're not going to talk now. Let's keep scooping up territory and then we'll talk. And the side that appears to be losing says, well, we can't negotiate from a position of weakness. We have to try to regain the territory we just lost. Why do you think Russia and or Ukraine wants to talk now? Well, I don't think Ukraine does want to talk. I think it would have to be the United States. Uh, Making a call. Yeah. I think Russia may want to talk for the simple reason that Russia has been defeated and failed to gain its maximal objectives. Um, and uh, well, Mr. Putin doesn't agree with that. I mean, maybe he tacitly uh, or implied something like that in his most recent remarks. Well, but he's also mobilizing more troops. Well, I mean, they have to mobilize. I mean, you know, if it's absolutely clear by now if they didn't, if they don't mobilize more men, they will lose because the Ukrainians are beginning to heavily outnumber them, precisely because they have mobilized and the Russians haven't. But, of course, when it comes to what Putin says and what Putin thinks, we just don't know. I mean, what he thinks may be significantly different. Certainly no serious Russian analyst I've talked to uh, thinks that, you know, Russia can win this war now. I mean, in terms of winning, absolutely. Uh, they hope at most to hang on to the territory. Status quo of, as of February 24th. Well, you see, to be able to present that as a success, they would have to get Western recognition. The thing is, you know, Russia has never formally withdrawn its demands at the beginning of the war. And they, at that point, did not talk about any, any areas beyond the Donbass and Crimea. It was recognition of Crimean annexation and Donbass independence. So, in principle, that is still the Russian demand. The Ukrainians can't agree to that unless we basically do it for them. Now, why might it be a good idea for us to do that? Well, I suppose two things. I mean, one is if really driven back. And a complete defeat in Ukraine, even just the loss of the Donbass, would bring down the Putin regime or force Putin to resign. You think? I, th I think so. But yeah. how? What's the mechanism for that? Assassination? I mean, business elites saying enough is enough? I was kidding about assassination. I'm just, you know, what's the mechanism for removing him from power? Well, that, of course, is the big problem, because as you I mentioned before our talk, I mean, with Khrushchev, when he was removed, there was the Politburo, you know, which got together and voted against him. And no such institution exists today. But, you know, these things can also be done informally. Napoleon in 1814, there was no mechanism to get rid of Napoleon. But the marshals yes. and the top state officials just went to him and said... Well, you also could have go. hardliners in Russia who want to go even further, who aren't willing to recognize the reality of defeat and want a full mobilization rather than a partial one. Indeed. And things can get worse as well. Things can get worse. And it's, it's entirely possible that Putin would be replaced by somebody like that. But the point is, of course, that just as Putin replaced Yeltsin by agreement, 
but has then spent the following 22 years blaming Yeltsin for everything that went wrong. The great advantage of getting rid of Putin is that his successor could then admit could admit all the terrible failures that had been made, but blame them all on Putin and say, but unfortunately, my dear compatriots, we are now not because of my fault or your fault, but we have been landed in this situation where we have to win. So you're calling for President Biden to get on the phone and or Secretary of State Blinken to get on the phone and get negotiations moving. What about China, China's role? Ah, uh, indeed. Well, China has been very, very cautious so far. They obviously did not approve of the war. They didn't want the war. There have been, you know, official voices from China expressing disapproval. It's very important to note there's been all this loose talk, including, you know, by the Russians and Chinese themselves, of a Russo-Chinese alliance. There is no Russo-Chinese alliance. They are not committed to fight for each other. And China has not yet given Russia significant aid, either military or economic. Of course, what Xi Jinping said to Putin at the meeting in Samarkand, we don't know, but obviously indications that he may have been pretty critical. But since then, we had the latest statement by Biden, which yet again was denied or partially retracted by his own staff on supporting Taiwan, going to war for for Taiwan. If you wanted to motivate China to try to pin down America in Ukraine so that it couldn't concentrate on China, you could not have made a better case to the Chinese than doing that. So what I'm saying is the Chinese are in a position massively to arm and massively to fund Russia. And also, China cannot afford to see Russia completely defeated if that you know, also implies a collapse of the Russian regime, a drastic weakening of the Russian state. That would threaten vital Chinese energy supplies and leave China seriously isolated on the world stage. It could stage. be a catastrophe for the entire planet if well, there's a state collapse in yeah. Russia. So what is U.S. policy toward Ukraine right now? What is the end game here? Uh, the arms and the money keep coming. I don't necessarily have a real problem with that. But we need to get on the phone is what you're saying. Well, yes, because I'm not sure that the administration itself knows exactly what its aims are. Certainly, the signals they've been giving to the world are utterly contradictory because you've had, we are arming Ukraine to defend Ukraine, but then you've had, we're arming Ukraine to weaken Russia permanently. Yeah. Yeah. Is it now is to drive all Russian troops out of Ukraine? What does that mean? Does that mean Crimea as well? That could take... A long time. Well, we don't know. I mean, we know what the Ukrainians are saying, which is yes, that is just what it is. But that, you see, is why the Biden administration line that peace negotiations are a matter purely for the Ukrainians and we have no say is ridiculous. I mean, imagine if you turned it round and, you know, Russia were involved massively in arming, in providing intelligence, in providing advisors on the ground to a country fighting America. Would America accept for a single second that Russia had no part in in the negotiations? No. And, I mean, obviously, the point is that America and, in a way, still more Europe by supporting this Ukraine in this way. I'm not saying the support is wrong, but there's no question but that it is running serious risks for us and for our citizens, economic risks, risks, you know, because of food shortages and inflation, instability, even God forbid, revolution in key American allies around the world in the Middle East and elsewhere. And of course, then, you know, if Russia is totally driven into a corner, the threat of nuclear escalation, which in the last resort could destroy the world. This situation, I think, is even more dangerous now than it had been as Ukraine makes gains on the battlefield. I don't think it's coming closer to resolution. I think the opposite is the case. And why the U.S. role, I agree with you, is so important here, because you can't expect Ukraine, which is fighting the war and trying to gain back its own territory, to sue for peace right now. Completely understandably, the Ukrainians are just too angry. I'd be angry myself. But, you know, they're furious. But that isn't the best counselor when well, it comes not. to rational behavior. Because when we look back at World War I from the vantage point of 1919, could the French say, maybe they did, that it was worth two million lives or however many Frenchmen died in that war to gain back every inch of territory they had lost to the Kaiser's armies in 1914? I would say no, but I'm not a French person living during World War I who wants to gain back all of your territory if territorial integrity is why you're fighting. 
Yeah. Well, that's why President Wilson offered to negotiate until America joined the war, of course, after the German submarine campaign. So about the First World War, unless there's anything else you'd like to add about this current situation right now? No, I, th I think that covers it. Just as I say that, you know, we will know in a week or so whether there is still a chance for peace, whether these referenda are intended yeah. to produce bargaining counters or whether we are in for prospect of n not necessarily endless hot war, but endless conflict. conflict. Yes. No end to a resolution where the sides can begin to repair the wounds and move on. Matter of fact, we may know that by the time this podcast is published. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, and So I want our listeners to keep that in mind. But the larger issues here are undated, as we say in the business. So about the First World War, I think of that war quite a bit, Anatole. That's why my friends think I'm kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> Putin is acting like a czar in a way, recruiting soldiers from uh, his domains, Central Asia, maybe elsewhere to fight Moscow's battles. I don't know if you want to say anything about that before I get to my larger point. Well, I don't think, contrary to some of the reporting, I don't think that Russia has been recruiting troops, particularly from the ethnic minorities. What it's been doing in a very familiar pattern is recruiting them from the boondocks. They don't want to recruit them from Moscow or even the other big cities, because that's where protests are really right, dangerous. A lot of people are leaving the country now, too. Indeed. But up to now, you know, they've been recruiting people from the, the rural areas, from Siberia, but, you know, ethnic Russians as, as well as non-Russians. But apparently, I mean, I was talking to a friend with relatives in Omsk in Siberia, and the, uh, the, the graveyards there are beginning to fill up with wow. dead from the war. So, um, yeah. Hal Brands, who is a scholar at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, wrote a piece for Bloomberg talking about the war in Ukraine, and he used the lessons of World War I to make his argument. He believes that what we're seeing now in Eastern Europe is a, a war between autocracy on the one side and liberalism on the other. And he said about the First World War, it was not an accidental war or one that policymakers sleepwalked into, which is a reference to a terrific book by Christopher Clark called The Sleepwalkers. Brands wrote, a determined but anxious Germany was willing to take risks to achieve goals it could not attain through peaceful means. The resulting conflagration was not a pointless slugfest. He says it was part of a longer-running clash between liberalism and illiberalism. I do not agree that that was what the First World War was fought over. What do you think? It is hard adequately to sum up how ridiculous that is. Uh, given that, for the first three years of the war, one of the key uh, the three chief allies against Germany was the Russian Empire, which, whatever else you want to call it, was not a liberal state. Moreover, of course, while Britain and France were democracies by that stage, they were democracies at home. Nobody has ever described the French Empire in Africa uh, or the British Empire in Africa or even at that point the British Empire in, in India and Asia as either liberal or democratic. No, I mean, what was true was that there were deep, deep issues involved, above all, of whether Germans or Slavs would control Central Europe as the Austrian Empire crumbled. You know, remember that Britain came in because of the German invasion of Belgium, but that's not where the war began. The war began in Eastern Europe, and the question was whether Russia or Germans would dominate that region. And, you know, that again was one of the key, or probably, I mean, you know, if you read Mein Kampf, that was the key underlying reason for the Second World War as well. So, no, I mean, the war was not pointless, but it was a war of nationalisms, not of, of liberalism against democracy. And, oh, and by the way... And uh, competing you know, empires as well, colonial empires. Indeed. And, so the victor went the spoils after that war, but go ahead. But also, and I covered the Balkans at one stage, and also the states of the Caucasus, Armenia and Azerbaijan and Georgia. Now, all their nationalist campaigns campaigns with each other for territory were massively democratically popular, vast, vast democratic majorities and demonstrations in favor of war. Yeah. Uh, liberalism, no. Yeah. Brands, and I did invite him onto the podcast. He's just too busy at this moment to, to do so, maybe in the future, because I wanted to talk to him about his thesis here. I think it's smart to bring up the lessons of World War One. I. I think he's getting them wrong. He's trying to make a point about what's happening today, that this is a fight against illiberalism and therefore the West, namely the United States, needs to take a tough stand against it. 
And you know, that is how Europe, I don't want to say sleepwalked into war, but too much inflexible thinking, tough nationalistic talk, not to get into the entire debate over the causes of World War I here. I think Christopher Clark makes some great points in his book, even if you don't buy the entire thesis. Why don't you respond to that? That was more of a word salad than a question, but go ahead. Something striking is that all the countries involved, all the main countries involved in World War I, they justified their war in part on the basis that they represented superior civilization. And so you had, yes, I mean, the British and the French claiming to represent a sort of superior Western civilization with democracy. The Germans claimed to represent a superior culture, culture, with better ideas for the organization of society. Russia fought in the name of some mystical, you know, idea of orthodox Slavdom saving mankind. And that's what Brands is really trying to do today. You know, he's trying to suggest that this is a a civilizational battle. But of course, the thing is, just as, you know, in in the First World War, this was, in terms of the the different players involved, largely nonsense. I mean, today as well, it's fascinating how Viktor Orban in Hungary is damned as an authoritarian chauvinist, uh, whereas the Polish regime next door are welcomed as great allies, although in terms of ideology, not merely are the two virtually identical, except one is Hungarian nationalist and the other is Polish nationalist, but many of their basic ideas are much closer to those of Vladimir Putin than they are to those of Joe Biden. Uh, you know, and then when you go beyond Europe, well, you know, it gets really complicated, right, with Mohammed bin Salman and Narendra Modi and company. So, Yeah, I don't buy the liberalism versus illiberalism no. stuff either. Well, you know, he's also saying, Brands, is that uh, it's wrong to say that World War I started by accident. I agree with him there. He said it was started because certain countries, namely Germany, were willing to take risks that they had – discrete goals in mind. But even there, I don't think the warring powers quite understood the war they were getting. Now, let me address the short war illusion, as Christopher Clark refers to it. He said that has been called into question because there were major figures, even in Germany, who said this would not be a short war. On top of that, though, Clark says they knew it, meaning they knew they could be potentially getting to a catastrophic long war. But did they really feel it? He says, so in that sense, they were sleepwalkers, watching but unseeing, haunted by dreams, yet blind to the reality of the true horror they are about to bring into the world. I mean, I think that describes Putin Mm. on February 22nd. It it does indeed. I mean, he obviously horribly miscalculated and monstrous incompetence, apart from anything else, apart from the criminality of it. This is why... You know, the people who say that Putin was totally cynical are wrong. I've often said about Putin something that John Maynard Keynes, the British economist, said about Clemenceau, the French leader at Versailles, that Clemenceau was a totally cynical individual, machine politician, utterly disillusioned about the French, let alone mankind in general, with only one illusion, France. But, you know, when it comes to the First World War, there is one parallel, I think, possibly with America and Ukraine today, which is that the deepest folly of any of the countries involved before the war was that of Russia in linking itself to Serbia and Serbia's territorial ambitions against Austria uh, and the failure to rein in the Serbs, which meant that when, you know, and this is true, that the Serbian Secret Service did assassinate the Austrian crown prince, Russia was so tied to its Serbian ally that it was dragged over the edge into a war which, by the way, I mean, having... Yes, so I had a French guarantee as well, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, having lost the war against Japan nine years earlier, many, many Russian officials were not at all super confident that they were going to win this war. But they had got themselves into a position where they couldn't back out again. This, I think, is is a risk with America and, and Ukraine and the Western Ukraine. If we give them a totally blank check, armed by us, supported by us, to achieve their own aims without, you know, trying to control them or assert our interests we risk being pulled over the brink into catastrophe. Because, you know, there's a, there's an episode in Putin's history, which he's often referred to, and, you know, his biographers refer to, when um, 
as a basically a slum kid in in Leningrad, he cornered a, a rat because you know one of the lo- local amusements was going around killing the rats of whom there were a great deal, and the rat being cornered bit him very severely. He's often referred to that. I think we should remember it as well. And my analogy about Putin and sleepwalking wasn't perfect. I do not mean that he sleptwalked into this war. But he certainly did not expect this, is what I'm trying to say. No, absolutely not. And that's why I think we should be careful not to assume that everything Putin still says about Russia winning actually reflects what he believes in private. And about the July crisis of 1914 to one of your earlier points there, after the assassination of the Archduke, had Austria-Hungary not dithered, it's been theorized that had they immediately punished the Serbs, insofar they could mobilize quickly, I mean, these things do take time, but had they immediately punished the Serbs, it is believed that the larger war would not have broken out, that the other countries, even Russia, would have been okay with something like that. Maybe. 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 Germans didn't help in this situation either. No. I mean, that was because the Germans thought that in the grand historical picture, they were losing. You know, Austria, a basically German, multi-ethnic, but German-dominated state, was falling to pieces. Russia, remember, though still backward compared to Germany, was growing very, very quickly economically in the decade before the First War. The Germans thought time was against them, and they had to... That's right. They gave the Austrians the blank check. Of course, France gave Russia a security guarantee as well. Russia mobilized before Germany. But I think what Clark's larger point is that the opacity involved here. Mm-hmm. People didn't know exactly, I mean, we could read about it today and know each step along the way, but it wasn't obvious. Uh, that's my problem when I try to penetrate the walls of the Kremlin. It's hard to know what's going on in there. Yes, it is indeed. And I mean, there are certainly people who want Putin out. I'm sure there are. If, if Russia suffers more serious military reverses in Ukraine and protests against conscription, really spread in Russia, which they could. This is the thing that actually gets people out when it's, you know, when war ceases to be a spectator sport and it's suddenly a matter of you or your son or your husband being sent off to die. I think you could get a situation in which an informal delegation, but a delegation of so many senior people that Putin could not ignore it, go to Putin and say, basically to save the rest of us and the whole setup, you and a couple of other people, including the defense minister, have to resign. But I think, you see, there is a risk that we are disabling the establishment opposition in a similar way to the one in which we disabled German military opposition to Hitler during the Second World War. It's often been argued, and I think there's an element of truth in it, that by declaring that only unconditional surrender was a possibility. We made it so much more difficult for German generals to act against Hitler because, in in a way, what did they have to gain? They were going to take over the state with all the opprobrium of having got rid of the leadership and weakened the state, and then they were still going to have to surrender and accept Soviet occupation. Um, well, that's because they shared many of Hitler's goals, though. We have to remember that. And what I mean is territorial aggrandizement in the East. Oh, that too. But yeah. then, Which uh, was unacceptable to the, the Allies. Oh, sure. But the point is that they didn't share those goals by the summer of 1943. They knew they were losing. Um, and they didn't, I don't think they wanted... I mean, we can talk about the Second World War, too. That's why I love you, Anatole. <laughs> they were not willing to give up territory gained in the East. Well, it depends where. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the you know the very bravest and most anti-Hitlerite of the officers like Stauffenberg, until after D-Day, they were not prepared to return the territories that Poland had annexed in 1919. But after Stalingrad and Kursk, they knew that Hitler's yeah. you know plans to annex large parts of the Soviet Union were over. Maybe we'll discuss this on another podcast. I'm sure something is going to come up here with this war in Eastern Europe. That no I'll, doubt. Yeah, well, you know, Anatole, I always love how you are able to make sense of my meandering, sometimes incoherent questions. Maybe I should have you back to talk about the First World War when I'm really prepared to do so. With great pleasure. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to maintain our focus on the war in Ukraine and look at it as the latest in a series of wars of Soviet succession. Michael Kimmage, historian of Catholic University, will be our guest. Next, as we report History As It Happens, podcast from The Washington Times. 